Welcome to Iowa Post Game here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. We've got a fun show on a snowy night here in the Midwest. But first, before we get to the content for this evening, Iowa Smokehouse is sponsoring our post game coverage, and we sure appreciate having good snacks for cold, wintry days where you're stuck inside. Tasting is believing. Find out how that's a fact at iowasmokehouse.com with their thick and tender cuts of beef jerky, their flavorful meat sticks or even their delicious steak bites. It's all good, and you can get 15% off your total order. You'll get free shipping with any $50 orders. So many good deals to uh, take advantage of right now from the comfort of your own home. iowasmokehouse.com. And again, use that code Hawkeyes for 15% off your order. Also want to thank Brad Van Meter and his team down at State Farm. Give them a call, 515-256-6480 for a quote. On insurance, whether we're talking uh, life insurance or perhaps auto insurance or the like, visit them online at bradbandmeter.com. Again, that's bradbandmeter.com. All right. Well, uh, what is this? 122 people on at about 20 till 11 for an Iowa men's basketball game. I want everybody, I just want everybody to know this is not a women's game that we're talking about this evening. So I uh, just want to warn everybody in advance. We have too many people here. I think we have more people on the show right now than we're actually in Carver watching the game. <laughs> Is that fair? All right. We're going to do things a little bit differently because you don't have Coach Gary Close. Due to weather, due to inclement weather, that's the excuse we're using for Coach Close this evening. He will not be on the air with us. Um, I sent out an open invite to a couple of people uh, kind of late in the game, but uh, we're just going to have a good time here for at least the next hour or so. So let's do things a little differently. Let's jump to our phone line. Before we do that, I want to make sure we give a shout out to RTI Threads. As we continue to get more football news, the importance of NIL is uh, just going to grow increasingly. 
So one way you can support NIL is, of course, through the collective, through the swarm, but also companies like RTI Threads. They're sponsoring people like Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, Zach Lutmer. They're also sponsoring this show. So, so many good benefits for supporting RTI Threads up in North Sioux City. Uh, visit them online, rtithreads.com. You can also shop Cooper DeGene's apparel line. This is the official merch partner and apparel partner of Cooper DeGene, who's going to be an NFL star next year. I'm convinced of that. He's going to be making an impact on an NFL team early and often. Visit his uh, official RTI Threads line at www.cd3lacesup.com. And uh, speaking of RTI Threads, before we get to our first caller, RTI Threads player of the game, without question tonight, a guy that we've talked about in the past that we felt, at least that I felt, was a much better shooter than he has shown. Uh, I think this team uh, has a potential of being a lot better than they've shown if he hits threes. And he has the best-looking jump shot on the team. Tell, I mean, you can tell me I'm wrong. I, I think he's got the best-looking jump shot on the team. Um, now, Peyton has a really quick release. I don't think his is always uh, – he's a really high-volume three-point shooter. He's phenomenal. But Josh Dix has a smooth – pretty stroke from outside and we finally saw that come to fruition this evening he is our rti threads player of the game ironically enough he's a uh, western iowa kid out of council bluffs let's go to our first iowa smokehouse caller of the day and by the way if you want to call the show the link is in our description you can also call the phone line at 515-635-1601 that's the iowa smokehouse call in line let's go to our first caller of the day let's uh Let's add Tony to the mix here. Tony, um, you're a little blurry, Tony, um, but here's the deal. Um, it's better visibility here than it is outside, and we're just happy you're safe. And it was only fitting that we bring you into this show first because uh, you're such a loyalist as it relates to this Iowa men's basketball team. Oh, hey, there we go. All right. Well, how about there that? So I was able to, I was able to, to banter and, and rant enough to get you to fix your camera. Tony, what do you have to say about tonight? Uh, well, I have coach close to I didn't, I didn't wear this, but I, I got this for, <laughs> you know, he, he, he tied, he tied uh, coach Davis. It sounds like he was very complimentary of coach Davis and um, I didn't get to listen to it. I had to run my trash out real quick. So I didn't get to listen to much of the post game stuff, but from what I'm seeing on social media, Fran was very complimentary of coach Davis and it sounded like he was pretty proud to be our coach. So. He was. He was very complimentary in talking with Brian Butch after the game. And uh, let me give a shout out to not only Fran McCaffrey for a huge accomplishment, but also uh, I was actually really impressed with the the job that Mike Hall did remotely. Yeah. I I ripped Mike Hall about a, a week ago. You remember that, Tony? Yeah. I, I was critical of Mike Hall. I got nothing against Mike Hall. I thought he did a phenomenal job tonight, mm -hmm. and he did it under very difficult circumstances. It went off without a hitch. Uh, give Brian Butch and the whole BTN crew credit. Um, they were short-handed, short-manned, undermanned, etc. They did a phenomenal job, and um, kudos to everybody that helped make the game possible. I know it's easier for me as an Iowa guy to say that after a win like this, but um, there's a good chance. You know, there was a chance this game wasn't going to happen, and boy, we're sure happy it did. Um, you know, I worked on this all day. You uh, gave me a hard time, or you were just mentioning this last game, uh, post-game show. You wanted to see what my screen looks like. So I just made sure this could uh, give you a mirror, you know, of the, if you see up. Oh, I, I, I do see it. <laughs> okay, I see it That's just dumb luck. I'm just, I don't know. I just noticed that. And I, <laughs> um, I do have to take victory laps because I remember it was about a month or so ago. I did say that I thought Josh, Josh Dix had the most uh, pro potential on this team. Okay, well, well I have to say it's one game. It's one game. I don't think he's going to be a pro, but I got to take my victory lap. What why do you say that? Just because of his potential as a 3 and D guy or what? Yeah, and I think he I think he has one of the best all-around games and tonight he got to showcase it. I mean, he played well on both ends. Yeah, uh, not, ju I mean, not just the offense, his defense was pretty good as well. He has not looked like anything close to their best player. Let's make that clear. Up until tonight, he has not showcased what you're talking about. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I think I said before, you've heard me say that. I think 
he is maybe the one guy that can be um, exponentially better, especially with his jump shot than he has shown thus far. And I don't know if that has something to do with the the lingering leg issue. I thought he looked pretty good last year. I mean, that was that was fresh off the the knee break. Um, but you know, one thing he's been is he's been very hesitant from outside. I think he hasn't been hunting shots enough. And with a guy that can shoot it like him, I'm guessing Fran finally just told him, you got to start putting it up. Yeah. Because he was- here's what I'll give Tony Perkins credit for. Tony does not have a pure jump shot. Tony yeah. is not a jump shooter. Tony does not have a great three-point shot. But you know what? He ain't afraid to shoot it. And that's one thing I really respect Tony Perkins for. He's not That's not his game necessarily, but he can make them here and there. But he ain't afraid. And that's what Josh Dix needs to learn from his – his uh, older counterpart is uh, don't be afraid to let it fly because you're right. He can dig in defensively just like Tony Perkins did as an underclassman, but uh, he's got an ability to help them outside. And we didn't see any minutes for Price Sanford tonight. So if no. Price isn't going to play, Josh has got to make threes. And we don't know. I mean, um, we don't know what Patrick's status is going to be either. He went to the locker room with that ankle, and I don't think he ever came back. Um, yeah, I'm just looking to see if I, I see any updates on Patrick yet. I don't see anything. I'll, I'll keep scrolling here. Um, and I don't believe, you know, this is this is a, a miss on my part. Um, I don't believe Tom Cakert is joining us this evening. And I'll admit no, to all of you. He didn't even, he wasn't at the game. No, yeah. that, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I don't think uh, Tom will be hopping on tonight, but uh no, uh, absolutely uh, huge from Josh Dix, like you said. Um, I thought Patrick gave him good minutes. He didn't force anything. I think that's the big thing. If Patrick's going to continue to start, I think shot selection needs to be reeled in a little bit. Uh, I'll say that. I know he's an, he's an upperclassman. He's a senior. His game is his game. I think his wild shots as he's driving in off one leg, I think that hurts them. I don't think it's one of those things where you're like, well, look, Steph Curry takes bad shots or Caitlin Clark takes bad shots, but that's their game. No, that's, I don't feel like that's the case with Patrick. I think he's best when he can get out and run, and they were able to do that at times tonight. Now, their defense in the first half was horrendous. Horrendous. Ugh. The last 15 minutes of that first half were some of the yeah. worst uh, yeah. <laughs> defensive minutes I've seen. Um, I have a stat for you, Tony. Maybe you saw it. I posted right. it to yeah, Twitter. Yeah. Of, six, of 16 first-half field goals for Nebraska, 14 of those were dunks and layups. Yeah. <laughs> and then one of the other ones was, was a, a three. So, yeah. like, cardinal sins. They gave and, up and tested two. So you, met, you said that 14 of the 16 were layups, okay? And then you uh-huh. have one – you have one or, – or dunks. And you have one three – that leaves three points, and those three points were off fouls drawn from touches in the paint. Yeah, uh, it was bad. And and let me just say this: we've, you know, Google eyed over googly eyed over uh, Owen Freeman for the past few weeks. He's been freshman of the week like every week in this conference. It seems like, but he got burned on a couple of plays in that in that first half. They're unacceptable. 18, 20 feet from the basket, and he's selling out for a steal and he gives up an uncontested dunk ridiculous and you saw fran get evan bronze in there quickly um you know bronze is a better defender although i still don't think bronze played great when he came in there um i don't know that iowa teaches post defense very well i'm certainly no expert but i just i see guys uh and i understand you know game plans change from game to game and you're gonna maybe defend different guys in the post different ways but rink masters are really skilled guy inside iowa wanted him he was a a bradley kid that was from that same no he's iowa poached some other players from that conference and they wanted rink mast at one point he's a talent i think they wanted i think uh kirky was one and mast was two because they he canceled his visit and stuff like but he's i tell you uh if i'm nebraska uh, i won by getting rink mast in there from bradley yeah yeah um i was going to comment that it seems like the game is slowing down for Owen as we keep going on. Yes, he does have mistakes on the defensive end, but it, it, it's a fine teaching moment. You, you know, he he played well, and you can pull him out like he did in the first half, and it seemed like it was a little better in the second half on the defensive end from him. But, I mean, those were some eye-opening mistakes in the first half from Owen. You know, on the, the game changed when they went to zone. Oh, they, yeah. They couldn't. 
they could not defend in the man. And that's a concern. That should be a concern for all of us because it's not like Nebraska is, uh, you know, just full of unbelievably quick and athletic players. No. Um, Iowa is just not disciplined in so many different ways. Uh, ways, but they were able to rebound out of the zone decently well. And what they were giving up as it relates to rebounding out of the zone was well worth it when you're forcing Nebraska to take threes. And Nebraska missed some open threes. But again, um, I'd much rather them have a few open threes and some contestant threes than a bunch of uncontested and contested layups and dunks. And that's all they did in the first half. They had one three in the first half. And they're only down five. Uh, I mean, you could say it both ways. One three for Nebraska on the road. You give up 41, you ought to be lucky you're only down five. But if I'm Iowa, I'm looking at this thing, and you gave up 14 dunks and layups, you shouldn't be ahead. So I'm sure both those coaches, Fran and Fred, both had some some words for their players at halftime. But, you know, like you said, Fran made an amazing adjustment there to switch to zone in the second half. Well, I mean, I don't know about amazing, but it's, I mean, he made an adjustment and it worked. Yeah, he made an adjustment on the def. he made an adjustment on the defense event. Right, which he, <laughs> yeah. I'm not but trying yeah. to discount oh, yeah. no Frank. Problem. He does that a lot. I mean, he switches yeah. from zone to man a lot. But it was the right move at the right time, and, and that's the only thing that helped Iowa really pull away. And, and give credit to another guy, Ben Cricky, had a really huge stretch in that second half. Nebraska was hanging around, and Cricky kind of took over for a few minutes, and that was good to see. Um, you know, he's he's shown off his range a little bit more. You know, he's hitting a lot of mid-range shots earlier in the year. Now he's hitting some shots from outside the arc. and um, you know, I thought he's a little timid earlier. They were sending double teams on Owen Freeman, yeah. and I thought Cricky could have probably been a little bit more aggressive, and and I think he got the message there in that second half, and he he really helped. Yeah, and they threw a lot of – it seemed like their their plan was to double any uh, post-touch because they threw a lot of doubles at Cricky as well when he was on the block. Especially in that second half, though. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. they're on yes. the floor at the same time. You can't double them both at no. all. I mean, you know, they're obviously not always going to be posting up. They're not going to be posting up at the same time, but – um, yeah, I thought in that second half, the tide kind of turned. And that's the advantage Iowa has of having two bigs, and they play differently, of course. Um, I still think Owen Freeman's probably the best player on the team, mm-hmm. as crazy as that sounds. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know who, you know, I've said maybe Tony Perkins before, but I don't know. There, that That debate is very valid right now. I mean, Owen Freeman, I didn't think did a ton offensively that was mentioned during the broadcast he finishes with 22 points 11 of 13 because everything he does is kind of just within himself he doesn't he doesn't uh play outside of it. he never forces jump shots you know that like he's never hunting for jump shots and why would he right um luca garza for the most part i mean he made jump shots early in his career but you play within yourself and i think that's what makes him great is he he runs the floor hard he gets up, he gets back. He shot. He blocks shots. He contests. He he is pretty good on the glass. Um, you know, disciplined defensively at times. We we talked about tonight, but for the most part, he's he's really been good on each end. I stand corrected in the chat that it was uh, Sherm who told Fran to go to zone. So I need to give credit to Sherm. How do we know this? Um, I'm guessing it was. I mean, there's two or three people that said Fran credited Sherm, James, Bob, and other people. So I'm guessing it was an our- odd. That's an odd – I mean, kudos to Fran if he's giving Sherm Dillard credit for that, but that's interesting that that would even come up. Maybe it was his, maybe it was his scout. It could have been Sherm's scout. I don't know whose scout it was tonight. Well, if it was Sherm's scout uh, – well, I, I listen, and here's the other thing. I can understand why they came out in the man because Big Ten Network was touting Nebraska as being you know, best three-point shooting team in the Big Ten, and all of a sudden they're killing you from inside – so part of that is, you know, chicken or the egg, right? I mean, are are they killing you because, you know, you're you're focusing on, on stopping the perimeter, you know, back and forth. So I I, I it's a good adjustment at the right time, regardless of who you credit. I'm guessing people are still saying that. I guess Fran told Brian Butch after the game. Okay, I didn't so that's, hear that's that. Weird. Yeah, I no. I missed that as well. Um, it's going to be interesting. For I'm going to bring up the women's game tomorrow. Um, to see if Indiana gets out because their flight's supposed to leave at 10. And our next opponent played in Bloomington tonight, and their flight was canceled for tonight, Minnesota. They're not going to be able to get out of Bloomington until tomorrow. And then we play them Monday night. Okay. Well, they play at home. so They play at home, but, I mean, they still got to get back. Sure. You know, they're they're on a road game now. I mean, that's – 
it's not ideal travel, obviously. It's not ideal travel for anybody. No, no, it definitely no. isn't. <laughs> I, I haven't seen, just so right, I've been in Iowa my whole life. I've not seen, I don't recall a day quite like this as it relates to snowing and blowing and, and all that nonsense. But anyways, I'm just happy they got this game in and I hope tomorrow night goes off that hitch. You don't want to have that game be rescheduled. I mean, like it's a, even if they get it rescheduled, you got Gus Johnson on the call. It's a Saturday night Fox game. Great exposure. I just hate rescheduled games to me. They just, we've had that happen too many times over the past few years for both teams. Mm -hmm. And it just, it changes, it changes the flow of the season. And then you, you might also get some contentiousness with rescheduling that because both coaches have to agree to the date. You know, the, the conference leaves it up to both coaches to say, okay, look, this is how we can work it out. You guys come to an agreement of this is when the game will be. I, I hope it's not, but I mean, if it comes to that, this is when the game will be made up. Yeah. Um, I, I will just close with, and then let you get to some other callers. Uh, can you spoil tomorrow night's guest or am I asking too much? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll just say this right now, Tony. My intention was to announce that earlier today, but okay. then they talk about Indiana's travel yeah. not happening. And I'm like, you know, do I announce it? Do I not announce it? So I, I'm happy to announce that tomorrow night, assuming we have a basketball game to talk about, um, Iowa, Indiana will be followed by Iowa post game with former Hawkeye great Kashin Alexander. So former all big 10 guard um, who unbelievable career at Iowa. Very, if there's anybody who's played in the Lisa Bluter era that in any way resemble Caitlin Clark. Now, now hear me out on this, not her ability from, from deep, but Kashin was so good on the glass for her size she she stuffed the the uh, the box score. So, anyways, uh, I'm looking forward to having Kashin on. I just hope we can get this game in tomorrow night. And that's what seven 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 p.m. Three? Central time for the stream. Fox regular over the air. Assuming Gus and, and his guy get there, I'm assuming it's. Oh uh, no, Gus is there. I don't know. Did you see the social media? Gus has been there since Thursday. Oh, is he really? He, he actually, you have to look this up, and I hope people don't go away from the show to this, but on Iowa Women's Social Media on X, um, there's pictures of him with Caitlin Clark, with Lisa Bluter. Like, Gus hammed it up with them at the practice and stuff like that. Gus is in town. Like, he, he's there. He's in Iowa City. He's there. He's ready to go. So I, I think the main thing is getting – Indiana in, and it sounds like they leave 10 a.m. our time tomorrow. I want to say so. Yeah. Oh, good to hear. No, I, I'm. That's man. I tell you, these last two games for the women, I, I'd say what they did the other night at Purdue, my their best offensive performance. I think without doubt that was their best offensive performance of the season. Um, and I think this was the men's best performance. The, the game against Seton Hall um, was a good win. This was also a good win. I'd say yes. equally as good of a win. Um, it was not complete on the defensive end. There are still gaping holes in that man defense. But offensively, when you look at the stats, and I, I had them on the bottom ticker here a little bit ago. I'll throw them back up here again. I mean, that's this is what you want. Balance? I mean, look at this box score, Tony. Owen Freeman, 22 and 10. Josh Dix, 16 points, 5 of 7 from 3. Patrick goes 12 and 5. Peyton goes 19, 10, and 5. Ben Cricky goes 12 on 5 of 7 shooting. Tony Perkins, 11 points, 15 assists, and two turnovers. Like, that is a dream Big Ten box score. And you're not going to get that every night, but that is exactly what you want. I was trying to see if they went up much in Ken Palm, but they didn't really after this game. So, But efficiency-wise, it was amazing. So, Absolutely. So, all right, I will uh, listen to everybody else, and we will uh, see you tomorrow night. Okay, Tony. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm as you can tell, I'm excited. I'm not trying to replace Gary Close on here tonight, but uh, <laughs> I uh, I got a lot to uh, to share. My my notes from the first half were quite simple, um, and it starts with the the seventeen to two start. Strong defense. I thought the first five minutes. I thought their defense was fine. Now I thought. Nebraska settled a bit from outside, and once they started uh, making a concerted effort to get to the rim, it changed. Things changed. In fact, Iowa only had, I think, six turnovers on the day. They had a, a 
flurry of turnovers during a six, nothing Nebraska run. And eventually Nebraska got back in the game, took the lead in that second half. I didn't think Iowa got the ball to, to Owen Freeman enough in that first half. I know they were sending double teams, but I thought they could have worked better off the double team. And, uh, they brought in another unit that I think was like Lodgy, Dembele, and you know maybe Desante Bowen. Those guys struggled. In fact, Desante didn't play really. Neither of those those guys played in the second half, and um, you know turnovers, fouls were kind of a problem during during that stretch. But for the most part, even during that stretch, Iowa kept responding with shots. So if you shoot the ball well, it can make up for a, a bounty of errors, and that's kind of what we saw. I thought from Iowa. In that first half, Emily is in the chat. She says this was uh, Iowa's best game of the f- season so far. I would probably echo that. Like I said, Seton Hall, I thought they played pretty darn good at Creighton, even though they lost that game. And uh, Brian, same thing. Great game, much needed win. Much needed win. I made the comment a couple games ago, they've got to win three straight, and I stand by that. I think they need to win at Minnesota on Monday. If they do that, then I think it's fair to start talking, even though we're still not even a third of the way through the season. I think it's fair to say, well, we're a fourth of the way. I think it's fair to say, hey, this team's got a shot at the tournament if they keep winning at this clip, okay? And Monday's an opportunity to get one back on the road. So uh, they've taken care of business, two straight at home, got to steal one at a tough Minnesota team, an improved Minnesota team um, that had their win streak snapped this evening. Let's go to our next caller, our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We've got Jake on the line. Jake, welcome. Hey, Corey. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Doing good. How are you, sir? Good. Um, so how bad is the snow down there? Because I got a bunch of family. I live in Minneapolis. How bad is the snow down there? Because I'm nervous that the game on Monday might get canceled and I was playing to go to the game. I can't imagine that this. Uh, like I say, the, the only concern I have for Monday is the temperature. Um, yeah, it looks like it's at least negative three up here. I- I don't think they're going to cancel a game due to wind chills, but if they ever were going to, it would probably be Monday. Um, I would. Well, think I was just that, nervous about the travel for the Hawks. Yeah, I would think it'd be fine. I would think by Monday, um, you know, our, Tony brought up Minnesota trying to fly back home and then Iowa getting up there. I mean, I would right. think uh, they would typically, I don't know this, but I would assume that they would charter to Minneapolis, that they wouldn't go by yeah, bus. They, yeah. I I go to basically every game when they come up here, and I always see that bus right out front of yeah. the arena. So I think they always charger charter football and basketball. You think oh, they go by bus? I think they go by bus. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, they might, and if they do, then... I could be wrong, but yeah, that's that's a, yeah. It's a drive. Uh, I don't know if, if they're if they're going by uh, if they're going by bus, then yeah, I'd be somewhat concerned. I don't know how long. I have not seen a, a winter storm quite like this one in a while. I made that comment a minute ago as well. Um, I think here in Ames, we've well surpassed a foot of snow this week, um, probably pushing wow. a foot and a half, and then just the winds tonight. But uh, the winds are going to calm down, but then you're going to talk about frigid temperatures, and I don't know what the effects are going to be on the roads for the next week or so. Um, is it possible the roads are bad for – you know, the foreseeable future, I suppose. Um, I would think that games, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about tomorrow night for the women to get that game in. Yeah, um, right. But um, opportunity for the men, you don't want to get a game canceled on, on their end either because they've got some momentum going right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember uh, Doug earlier in the year who comes on all the time said like, after the Wisconsin loss, like, yeah, would have been nice to win this one, but these next three are huge took care of business at home must wins obviously minnesota they are playing better but i mean i heard a stat that they had the 300th like worst non-conference schedule in the nation yeah it wasn't good i mean it was terrible and then they haven't played that good a competition in the big 10 so far so i mean you really don't know how how good they are but big 10 on the road is always tough no matter what um, it is, and if you recall, you you know this because you're a Minneapolis guy. Minnesota was hogwash last year. Uh, last couple had, of years, ha- haven't had an opportunity to use that word in a while. They were absolute hogwash <laughs> last year, and Iowa went up there and struggled. And that was a better Iowa team. They went up there and struggled to get a win. I believe it was Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, found a way to win, but um, it's it's yeah, it's never easy to play in the barn. It's I don't know what the do. You, have you been to a game this year? What the attendance is like for the men's team? 
I have not been to a game, but uh, I got basically all my buddies are Minnesota grads and stuff, and they just complain about how the attendance has been down and how just just kind of just like how sad it is that the attendance is down and even though they're having a better year, it's still not good. So I don't know with the cold temperatures on Monday, who knows what it will be. I mean, people will be off work and stuff because it's MLK day, but I don't know. They're, they're having a better year so far. So you would think people would make it out to the game, but either way, it's, you got to win that game. I still think we're better than them. I hope so. They, they shouldn't have lost to Michigan at home. That's the one I know you mentioned Wisconsin on the road, but that Michigan game is one that should should still be bothering them. I mean, you got to flush it. I get it. But if you look back at the schedule, you're like, hey, we're two and three. We should be three and two with a chance to to go four and two. And then you're four and two. Like, wow, like we're in a pretty good spot here, even though we've got some pretty gaping holes um, defensively. I don't think this yeah. I've said it before. I know Gary has said it before, but Jake, I don't think this conference is very good. Like, no, it's not. I don't very think good. so either. Yeah, I don't think so either. It's the worst it's been in a while. Um, yeah. Uh, I got a question for you. So tonight we didn't see Bowen in the second half at all. Um, I was hoping maybe that since Patrick had a game off, we would maybe see Dix or Bowen start, be in the starting lineup tonight. Obviously, P Max started and. Dix played great off the bench, which he struggled off the bench most of the year. Um, what I'm nervous about Bowen is I said it in the chat a couple of days ago is that he might transfer after this season, which we've seen other guys in this program do because Fran likes to play 10, 11 guys, which takes playing time away from guys that are decent players. You see Tucson transfer, Frederick transfer. You see um, – Christian Williams in the day back, um, Macy Daly, um, like guys like that who have talent. I think Bowen has talent. I think he's better than Euless. He needs to work on a shot, but I think he has better talent than him. And I don't know. I think it's disappointing to see him not play at all in the second half. Well, I'll tell you, um, he wasn't good when he played in the first, right? I mean, he wasn't good. Um, he airballed a three from the corner. Um, He's just, I mean, first of all, Tony was really seeing the floor well tonight. I'm guessing that's what Fran would say. I mean, 15 assists, two turnovers is indicative of that. Uh, and I thought Brock Harding in the second half played really well. And, of course, he plays better with Freeman on the, on the court. So I think Freeman's emergence helps Harding's cause for playing time. Um, but, yeah, I, I get your concern. I think DeSante Bowen, no, without question, was a better prospect at a high school than any of the guys you just mentioned. Like better pro, pro better prospect than Joe Tucson, Macy Daly. I mean, with all due respect to Macy Daly, he went on to play at Akron. Christian Williams went on to play, I think, at Indiana State. Um, Desante Bowen was a four star kid who I think's got really good upside. Something's just not clicking yet. And I would like to think, you know, Fran's not a Fran's a loyal guy. He's going to go back to him. Um, and I still think they're going to need him. In fact, I said, I think it was after the Rutgers game, Jake, I made the comment that, hey, the two guys I'm looking for to step up are Josh Dix and DeSante Bowen because Dix can shoot from outside. He's a guard, and DeSante Bowen is a facilitator and an attacking guard, an offensive-minded point guard that they absolutely need. We always hear about guard play winning in, in March. He needs to step up, and D Josh Dix did his part tonight. Hopefully that continues. If that happens, what you're talking about, Jake, if he can somehow emerge – and I, again, I wouldn't read too much into him not playing the second half tonight other than, hey, he had some guys that were rolling in front of him. If he can emerge, they got a chance to win a lot of games. They, they do, because then you're talking a, a guard court of Josh Dix, Tony Perkins and DeSante Bowen. And then you Brock Harding is kind of like a fourth option. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I Last thing I have for you is the... So the last two games, we've obviously won huge wins. Um, late in the second half, we brought in Evan Bronze for like literally one or two minutes. And it's he commits a foul. He has a turnover. And Fran immediately yanks him. Um, as a player, I feel like you either need to stick with him 
or don't play him at all. Because when you just put him in for one or two minutes and then take him out when he makes one mistake, that just kills his confidence. And then when he goes in, he just thinks, all right, I can't make a mistake. If I make a mistake, I'm going to get pulled. And then he's thinking too much and he doesn't play well. So I either think you have to play him or not play him at all. I I see your point. I think that I think uh, again to play devil's advocate on Fran's side is I I don't think the plan is really to play Evan Bronze that much. So he came in there. I felt like when Owen Freeman had started to struggle uh, defensively in that first half, and he comes in and kind of spelled that. And then he, like you said, he picked up the foul, gave up an and one. Um, I think the the frustrating the the cause for frustration on my part with as it relates to Evan Bronze is. I like Evan Bronze. Had him on the show. Nice kid. Iowa City kid. It's a cool story. Him being able to be reunited with Patrick. All that stuff. But the fact that they swung and missed so hard in the portal that they had a scholarship that they could give to a kid who was coming off the bench at Belmont. You know, that's that is frustrating. Um, and I do think he's better defensively than Ben Cricky, but he just doesn't have an offensive game. He just he doesn't. He's kind of like you know who he's like, Jake. He's like Ahmad Wagner. He's like Football a player. slightly less, yes, a slightly less athletic. And he's athletic, but I don't think he's Ahmad Wagner athletic, but he's mm-hmm. a slightly less athletic version of Ahmad. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I just like to see that either you play him or play him a decent amount or not. Cause yeah. I just feel like I've been in that position in like high school ball. And it's like, I'm getting nervous to go in cause I'm scared to make a mistake. Yeah. Um, I get you. Yeah. But uh, anyways, thanks for having me on. Uh, huge, huge game on Monday. I'm super excited. I'll be there. So it um, would be a great win on the barn. The barn and then got Purdue in Carver where, you know, they've seen beatable on the road. So that would be a lot of fun too. So appreciate you having me on and go Hawks. All right, Jake. Appreciate it, sir. Absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, big game. Big game coming up on Monday, um, as Jake brought out. And uh, that will also be a BTN game, kind of the opposite of tonight. Tonight was a late tip, 8.30, weird, oddly late tip. Part of that, I think, was a big part of that was because of the Nebraska-Iowa wrestling meet over in uh, Lincoln. But then on Monday, it's a 5 p.m. start. Now, it's Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so there's a lot of basketball games. Excuse me, more basketball games during the day than typical. But um, Anyways, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, Scott in the chat. Yes, great win at Carver this evening. And Brandon brings up six Hawkeyes in double figures and a couple with double doubles. Yes, Tony's 15 assists tying B.J. Armstrong, one short of the assist wiggle game record? Single game record. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that. And uh, again, our RTI Threads player of the game was Josh Stick. 16 big points for the Council Bluffs native. Five of the seven from three. I would guess he's never taken seven shots, seven threes in a college game. And not saying he needs to do that every night, but uh, him taking one or two threes is unacceptable. Just unacceptable. He's too pure of a shooter to do that. And he's good on defense. So uh, I think, you know, the guy that he, he's a guy, DeSante Bowen's probably the other guy. There's two guys on this team that you think if you're Fran, hey, I can get more out of these guys. It's those two, right? Like Cricky's giving you what Cricky's going to give you. Patrick's probably giving you what he's going to give you. Tony's giving you what he's going to give you. Same with the Sanford. Well, like Price is going to shoot better at some point in his career, but Peyton's doing what he can. Get those guards doing what they do best. Let's go uh, to our next Iowa Smokehouse caller. We've got James. James, welcome. How you doing? Doing good. How are you? First off, I want to talk about obviously the not so good parts. First, obviously, you know, even even when you win, there's still parts of the game that aren't great. You know, as a coach, I definitely know that too. Like you could win a game by 40. Sometimes there's still stuff that you can still work on in every game. And one of them was something you brought up to was defense for sure, especially in the first half. And I feel like a lot of it was out of position if you watch it, or a lot of it was like, like you said, uh, Owen going for the steals when he didn't need to. If he stayed in position there, he, I don't think Alec would have got to the rack on him that easy. You know what I mean? He got a position, try to get the steal, and then they put him out of position for Alec just to dunk it every time. And then a couple of times, I feel like they played too far up sometimes, and the guys would just drive. They were giving up cutters. They looked like they were going the ball, and they were giving up back cuts the whole time, too, and it kind of put them in a bad situation, too. I feel like, obviously, like you said, they hit shots well enough. 
you know, to keep them from losing in that respect, but they were giving way too many back cuts and way too many just easy drives to the hoops. Nebraska back cuts a lot. I remember that uh, came up a year ago when they lost in Carver. Um, yeah, but then should you know it even more then and not just quit ball watching? Then if they do it a lot, you should know even more and quit ball watching. Yeah. When that's what we're doing with ball watching. Right, yeah, I'm not making an excuse. Believe me, the yeah. interior defense was a sieve much of the game. In fact, uh, almost the entirety of that first half, the exception being the first four or five minutes. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. Not arguing with you on that, James. And, and then another thing, too, even when we were in the 2 3, they were struggling because if you watched the first time we got in the 2 3, they weren't passing a lot. You know, they were passing one, two passes and shooting a three that probably shouldn't have been shot. In Nebraska was at first, right? Like when we were the first guy, that's kind of what gave us the lead a little bit, was because they were just passing a couple of passes and then shooting a shot. They weren't moving the ball around. Once they started moving the ball around a little bit, they did get it to the low, like the low post, you know, the low wing, the uh, dunker spot, and they. And we're finding success there, you know, the slot. Part. They're finding success there. Yeah, Nebraska started to work their way through that zone. Yeah. And like They missed some threes in that yeah. second half. Um, But, again, kind of like the women the other night. Like, if you're playing this efficient offensively, you're going to matter. Play. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, it does matter. but It, it does matter. But it helped them, it helped it them in transition a couple of times. It helped them in, a couple, in transition a couple of times, too, because they put guys in the right spot in transition off the misses. And to but them playing the zone helped them in transition. Guys By the way, spot. Mr. Gibby guy in the chat says P Mac apparently came back to the bench, sat, stood up, walked without a noticeable, noticeable limp. So again, I didn't even see that. And I think they um, needed they probably did, they didn't need him at that point because they were up by so much. I think Fran yeah. was just like, yeah, let's not put him back in the game. Absolutely. But I, obviously, the offense is something that you like to see. Like you said, one thing I do want to give him credit to kind of is P Mac in retrospect. Of like we talked about how inconsistent he can be, and he didn't have a great game, but for his standards, like. Obviously, 12 points, five rebounds, two assists. Like, if he can give you that, I feel better sometimes than him giving you, you know, two points. Some days he'll give you two points, he'll give you four points, he'll give you no rebounds at all, you know, barely any assists. So, like, tonight he played a lot better coming off the sickness. I feel like that he's played in the last couple of games at least. So, I think we got to give him a little bit of credit because, you know, we have been a little harsh on him. Not harsh on him, but he has not played well. But we've also got to give him credit when he does play a little well. Yeah, I thought he was, I thought he was solid. I thought he was solid tonight. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we've been harsh on him. Not I, harsh on him, but like, I, I feel like it's reasonable. It's I, I feel like it's reasonable. But for their, of him for, yeah, for their size, it might be harsh, but it's critical and it's reasonable criticism, if that makes sense. But like, for other yeah. people, it might be harsh. That's what I kind of should probably point it at. But, but no, I feel like this is the game you need, especially the way Nebraska's been playing. And Nebraska come into it was a 13-3 and basketball team. I don't care who you play. In general, like it's a 13-3 basketball team. That's a team that's won a lot of games. It's just, you know, beat us twice last year. Like, that's a good win for you guys, even if it's at home or not. And I know the crowd, obviously. I don't know how good the crowd would have been even without the weather. I'm not going to lie to you. You, just, you just know that's how it always is. But, obviously, with the weather, it makes a big difference. But it's a good win, especially after they just beat Purdue. So, like you said in the comment, after they just beat Purdue by 12, yeah, that's a good win, especially against you on Texas. It shows you could. But I also want to say to the last caller, my bad. Go ahead. I was just to say, we talk about letdowns all the time. There's going to be that calling card yeah. for for Nebraska fans. How's the letdown going on the road? Sleepy Carver coming off a win. I mean, whatever, right? You got to get Big Ten wins. Whether it's a letdown defensively, Nebraska was not very good defensively tonight, but Iowa was really good offensively, and Iowa just made shots. Sometimes it just comes down to can you make shots, and they haven't always made threes. But when you get you know, four or five from Dix and you get, you know, you get Cricky makes a three and, you know, you're, you're going to get yours from Peyton and from Tony at times. So, um, you know, get just, I just feel like we're kind of having the same conversation we had after the women's game the other night. Yeah. Um, the defense wasn't great. We understand that, but e efficiency wise, they were but, as good as they've been all year. On but for the, for the women though, it's at least more consistent. It's like if the defense ain't great, you know what you're getting on the offensive side. From this team, it's like you don't get this every night in the offensive side, so it kind of does scare you when the defense still laps, even though you win by 18, 16, whatever they won by, right? I think that's more of the point. It's like you know they're not as consistent. as like Kaylin Clark will give you buckets when she needs to. Nobody really on this roster if I can give you buckets when they need to. They don't have a Clark. I'm not comparing them anybody to her. I'm just oh, saying. That's, but you're exactly – that's a good way to put it. They The men don't have a Caitlin Clark. So – like you're exactly right, James. What what you're saying is almost to a T correct. Um, now I think the men had again 
comparing two different games, two yeah. Kind of, yeah. in some respects, two different styles. But you take Caitlin Clark off the women's team. It'd be bad. Yeah, they'd be. Well, I don't know, but it'd be bad. But I mean, where, it where wouldn't would it be, be as obviously as good as they are. They wouldn't know. They'd probably be male to pack in the big time, probably male to more. Yeah, I mean, kind of like yeah. the men. Yeah. That's what kind I'm of saying. like the men. I think it'd be the exact same pretty much. But one thing I want to say too is like it also helps you when a team shoots four of 26 from three. Like Nebraska's really good three point shooters and they didn't shoot well. I don't know how many Tomonaga shot. I'm looking right now. Hold up. Tomonaga shot five and only made one. And he's one of the better three point shooters in the Big Ten. So I feel like kind of slowing him down too kind of gives you an advantage in that retrospect too. But yeah, when anyone makes one three yeah. um, and one assist, three turnovers, you're going to take that from Kese Tomonaga. For sure, especially since he's one of the better players. I feel like in the Big Ten, for sure, I got to give him his credit to be due. But it's always good to beat Nebraska and anything. doesn't matter what it is. We beat him in wrestling, you know, before that, and then we go beat him on the basketball court. So it's always good as well. And obviously, Minnesota's a game you need, especially playing Purdue, like you said, inside Minnesota. But I think it's a game we can get, and we got to show that we can win road games and true road games in the Big Ten because obviously you're going to get some more this year. But we just got to show you can win those games, you know, especially in Minneapolis and in Whatever you can win, this win the games you can, you win the games you're supposed to win. If that makes sense, win the games you should win at least, so you can put yourself in a good spot. I feel like for the end of the year, do we play Nebraska twice this year? Or do we want to play them once? They don't go to Lincoln, unfortunately. I mean, I, don't know. I say unfortunately because I'd like to run over there, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for you, yeah, but I'm for, I wouldn't mind not playing the team too because that could be a good win on our schedule. Like, obviously, we're, it's what January. But you still have to talk about tournament in general. That could be a good win for a resume if we do get to that point. And if they keep winning, that could be a good win on our resume as well. I think it's something you always have to look forward to. But oh, one name too that I was surprised he didn't play was Price, but I think it's good for him. He doesn't play every night because sometimes it maybe shows you like you're not always consistent. And we didn't need him, I feel like, as well, the way we were shooting tonight. But I would have liked to see him maybe get a little bit of minutes. But I also understand the point of like he wasn't playing, he hasn't been playing well the last couple of weeks. So you kind of got it. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I agree. Um, go with the hot hand. And, you know, when Josh Dix is giving you threes, that's the one thing I thought Price might be able to give to this team heading into the year is, hey, the kid can come in and shoot. He's not shot well. And yeah. not saying to abandon him, but Josh Dix is a second year guy, more experienced, much better defensively than Price Sanford is. Get his shot going. And that's one thing, too, when you have as much depth as Iowa does, where they go 10, 11 deep, sometimes you can do that much better. Like, not go back to Bowen. You don't need to go back to Bowen because you can trust Brock in some situations. You can trust Dix when he's going. I think that's a benefit early on in the year, you know, even in big time play sometimes because you know you have multiple options, but you don't have to use all those options sometimes because if you have the high hand, you can just sit those options out. But some nights you're going to need the options. You know, like Bowen, some nights we're going to need Bowen, especially on the defensive side. And sometimes on the offensive side, depending on – he did, you're right, he wasn't good tonight. The air ball three was really bad. I don't even know really why he shot it, but it's whatever now. It's kind of a point, but I'm saying you have all these options you can use, and I think that's a good thing as well. Yep. I agree, James. But it was good talking to you. I probably won't be uh, there on Monday because I have a game, so I probably won't be there on Monday, but I'll be tuning in, you know, making sure I will win. So. Talking to you tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I'll be on tomorrow. Hopefully that game gets played as well, too, and no matter what happens, I just want safe travels for Nina. Like, if the game can't get played, it's more important to have safe travels than it is to play a basketball game, obviously. You know, like, you don't want to risk nothing over a basketball game, obviously. I'd love to see the game play. You know, it's going to be a big game, but travel's more safe than anything, so. There you go, James. Thank you, sir, and yep. we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Yep, enjoy your night, and go Hawks, always. Thanks, James. Appreciate James calling our Iowa Smokehouse line, as always, and um, let's see, there was a, one more comment here. Jake, uh, in the chat, he says, I love seeing Tony P continue to shoot the three ball, even when it's not knocking it down. Previous years, he would pass up wide open threes. That's what I said here at the outset. Absolutely agree. And that's where I think Josh Dix has a learning curve. And I don't know that it's going to be a huge learning curve. Uh, but speaking of Tony Perkins, I think we have a spe our special guest here, Mr. Frank Henderson, <laughs> Coach Frank Henderson, uncle of uh, TP himself, Tony. Uh, Frank, good to see you. Uh, you made it back home, and uh, you you were not at the game. We'll make that clear, but you were somewhere yeah. watching the game, so I'm glad to see you. What's the weather like in Indy? Uh, I don't know if you can hear it in my background. My audio is good enough, but the wind is really hitting my window kind of hard. So we're having this wind flurry, snowstorm, I guess, brewing in. So it's getting ugly outside. So I, I made it home right before it got too icy. So I'm good. We're happy to see you here. and uh, Happy to be here. I 
tell you, I, I echo what Jake said here. Uh, I made the comment here at the outset, you know, obviously very balanced stat line this evening. Um, and, you know, Tony Perkins is obviously uh, your, your nephew is an older guy now. Um, he's been through the gamut. But I look at this stat line and I see, hey, 11 points, 15 assists, two tur turnovers. There's a guy who's really seeing the floor well, A. And just because he's not hitting his shots, he's not afraid to shoot. And I think that's one thing that Josh Dix is learning and needs to learn quickly because he's got a smooth shot. I mean, you're a coach. Does Josh Dix not have the best-looking three-point shot on the team? Man, I think Josh is a very confident kid that needs to take more shots when they're open. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to miss every shot that you don't take, you know? Same thing kind of when I explained to Tony, and I'm pretty sure that Fred explains to the rest of those guys. Like, you're going to miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So I think this team, I would teach this to be more aggressive offensively. Like your comment said earlier, we don't have a Caitlin Clark. We don't have a, a, a Keegan Murray at this moment. You know what I'm saying? But we do have rising stars that can, you know, collectively play together and win games. Even tonight, you know, Tony had, what, 15 assists, which is a career high, which I think is an awesome game. This team historically has always been versatile in the sense of how they win games. It's not always the same multitude of, okay, this guy's going to do X, Y, and Z. No, we have a, a, a front three, a front four, a front five, even with Owen Freeman. Hey, who's going to show up tonight? Who's going to win the game for us? And just having those, you know, multitude of weapons is what France always recruited into his Iowa's program. So, I mean, you know, I, but again, to, to your point about Josh Dix, I mean, shooting open three, building that confidence. I know Peyton's talking to him. I know Tony's talking to him. You know, I think this team's going to be pretty good down the road. And just to refresh people's memories, because you're his uncle, you, you've you been witnessing this career like we as, as Iowa fans have, but on a different different level. Tony was not always this confident. And I look at the stat line and I see, you know, hey, great stat line, 15 assists, two yeah. turnovers. But he was three of 12 from the floor, two of eight from three. But I'm like, I walk away thinking, OK, two of eight. I don't have a problem with eight attempts because every shot he took, I felt was a good shot. Right. And he does not hesitate to put it up when he's open and it's a good shot. He's going to take it. And that's what he needs to do. And he's nobody's claiming that Tony's the best three point shooter on the team, but he's a capable three point shooter. And that's what I'm saying. I think that's, that is what Josh Dix can take from his older teammate, Tony, let it fly. Yeah. And, just let it go. Yeah. And one thing that Tony did as an underclassman, Frank, that I thought made him particularly valuable is, is his ability to defend. And that's what we're seeing out of Josh right now. Yeah, I think Josh is definitely stepping up his game from last year to this year. Again, his confidence, having the right leadership around him. And like you said, when you have guys who are ready to let the ball fly, ready guys to attack, guys who are ready to score position, it draws the defense in so they can't sag off to our team's best player. You know, we don't necessarily have a defined best player on the team. You know, I can say maybe from front load, maybe maybe with Tony and Peyton, it's probably our, our, our front two we look to first. Even with Ben Cricky being a third option and Owen Freeman, a rising star. And again, Patrick with his years of experience. But again, when you have five guys who are putting on the floor every single night and a threat to score, the defense can't sag off nobody, you know. So we have to collectively continue to win games as a team. And and we should talk. You mentioned Owen Freeman. Uh Talk, share a little bit about what you've been able to gather from Tony about this young man. How special is Owen Freeman as a freshman? Man, he's he's game ready. I like Owen's confidence. You know, coming in as a freshman, you really have nothing to lose. You know, I'm I'm dedicated. My head's to the ground. I'm listening to my seniors. I'm listening to Fran McCaffrey, and I know I have another three more years to 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 continue my path on at Iowa, unless you know I have a great year or second year, third year, and go to the NBA. So as a freshman, you have nothing to lose. Just kind of follow your guidelines from your coach, from your senior leadership, and continue to play his game. And I think with him having his, his – was a high school teammate? They were they were high school – was it AAU or high school teammates? High school, yeah. High school, yeah. yeah. So, Owen transferred in and played with, with Brock his senior year, yep. Exactly. So you got to think, if I have my best friend with me, if I'm Jordan, I got Pippen with me, and I have a, a, a group of guys who's ready to support what I'm doing, man, come on, man, the sky's the limit. Lemansky with the Super Chat. Thank you, Lemansky. Previous game, I uh, stated young players will determine next 30 days. MVP stated time flies fast. Freeman and Dix show us flashes versus Hoiberg. How much truth is there? You were you played Division I college basketball, Frank, yourself. 
how much truth is there to the mantra that um, guard play wins in March? Do you, have you found that to be true? Having a solid three, you know, wins your games. I think, you know, we cannot take away from the credit of actually having solid bigs, you know, because the way the NBA has showcased his talent amongst the guard play and taken away from the, from the paint possessions from bigs that we have. But when it comes down to it, if you look at, you know, years prior, like the Houston and the Gonzagas, yes, they had solid guard play when they won the championship, but they always had a post presence that defined the game, you know? So I think with Owen Freeman, you know, Patrick being a versatile um, um, wing to post player, Ben Cricky being versatile to wing the post because that's saying Ben Cricky sometimes step out and shoot that three. So again, having that guard play with the presence of a good post and inside out game, I think that can take you to, to win games anywhere, not only in March, but I mean, early in the season as well. Thank you again, Lemansky for the super chat. Do appreciate that. And, um, Couple questions. Do you have a couple minutes to take a couple calls, Frank? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I got some time. Let's uh, let's let's hit a couple of these in the chat first. So Kelly wants to know about attendance. The official attendance per <laughs> per the NCAA box score was nine thousand six hundred seventy. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. Uh, so obviously that's not true. Uh, I don't know. You know, I'm assuming that's the number of tickets they sold. Um. I don't know how that's possible uh, attendance wise, but anyways, that's what the NCAA box score says. I would say there was, I wasn't there. I got a friend who was there. In fact, I saw him down on the, like right at the court in the sideline toward the end of the game. So like he's getting down court side. There's very few people at this game uh, and that's okay. I don't think this game was going to be won or lost by a crowd. Um, unfortunately, Frank, you've seen this uh, from afar. Um, there has been less in-person attendance for men's basketball games at Iowa recently. And and I'm guessing that, you know, I'm not saying you, Tony's coming back and reporting back to you how he feels about the situation, but I'm guessing that the players kind of have to kind of be irritated by that in a good way, like kind of puts a chip on your shoulder that, Hey, people, people are going to go out and see the women every night and sell out every night. And people aren't going to come out here and watch us. We'll show them. Is there, do you think there's a bit of that chip that that could play to their advantage? Yeah, I think, um, you know what, when it comes to attendance, I mean, you got to think, you know, offense brings that crowd, you know, and I don't mean that no, you know, shot at Iowa, but I mean, we have to be an offensive juggernaut and powerhouse because that, that sells tickets, you know, we have to have those, those big names and win those big games and big moments to constantly put people in those seats, you know. I mean, I think this year is an okay year for us. We we, we can be better. Um, but just as of late, you got to think, you know, the, the women's basketball is, is taking the forefront of Iowa's basketball in general. You know, you got Caitlin. They went to the NCAA championship. You know, I think we're at the point to where Iowa fans know, okay, our basketball team is good enough to get us to the NCAA tournament, but can they get us to the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight? Until they kind of shown that here in the recently in the past 10 years, I think we'll start seeing more seats for the, I mean, more butts for those seats. Yeah. And that's the obviously Caitlin Clark effect, but right. that's the most noticeable team difference right now is the men have not broken through at least the second weekend. We'll see. I think they got a shot now at two and three in the big 10. Um, what's been the psyche of this team? You, I mean, you have a nephew on the team. It, has the psyche been good? I mean, it sounded like they were dealing with some stuff a few weeks ago, but do you get a good feeling about the attitude of these guys? I mean, I think they all they all like each other. I don't I don't I mean when I talk to Tony, everybody's in good motion. Everybody has confidence they're gonna win this year. Everybody's in good headspace to to go as far as possible. Um, but again, just to key on who's gonna pull out those late game wins for us? You know, who is it gonna come down to? You know, Tony can get you a quick you know, 10 points, 12 points, 20 points, 25 points. Payton's going to knock in a couple of threes, but we just need more consistency from our two-star players to really say, hey, we're going to go far. Um, but, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say, Corey. I mean, you know, but as far as just the morale amongst the team, they're confident. I wouldn't say they say, okay, you know, the season's over. We're going to, you know, be one and done. No. They're fighting for wins. They're confident. They feel like they're the best team in the Big Ten. And, you know, as long as you have that attitude, I think you can go places. Amtom72, nothing better on a cold, snowy night in Iowa than sweeping the Huskers and 
hoops and in wrestling. So it was a good night on BTN. Ben says, uh, thoughts on Brian Butch? Seems like a good guy, but I don't think he's the greatest analyst. I have no problem with Brian Butch. I think he's good. Uh, I have enough. Obviously, I like Jess Settles a lot, but um, I think Brian does a good job. And I thought Mike Hall and Brian Butch did a phenomenal job. I said that at the outset with Mike not being there, getting stopped on the way to Chicago, apparently due to weather. I just thought that he did a really good job remotely. And um, Kelly, where's my CD3 hoodie? Well, um, I got to wash it at some point, Kelly. So I <laughs> appreciate your <laughs> concern. Uh, I try to wear it just about every night. Uh, Parker says, uh, will Owen Freeman have a Garza-esque legacy? Um, your nephew played with Luca Garza briefly, right? One year? Am I correct? Yep. Yep. One what year. Yep. What um, has there? Do you think there's similarities between Owen and Luca? I mean, Luca obviously showed the ability to stretch the floor even as an underclassman and they have different styles, but I think Owen seems to have the most upside since Luke at that position. Yeah. I, I think they both have a scores mentality, you know, either I think with some players in just basketball in general, either you have or you don't. I think Owen Freeman just came in with a scores mentality. I think he's more athletic than Luca. I think he can guard the post better than Luca, you know, but Luca in itself was a dominant threat to which nobody could, could handle or guard or defend himself. You know, so I think Owen's going to have the versatility of, you know, guarding the team's best player and being the best offensive player on the team coming years, you know, in the future. You know, so I think he has the upside on guards as far as defense and offense. So um, there's a lot of potential for that young man. Just continue to grow and continue to work on his game. And um, Bob wants to know about the women. They have not made it to Iowa City yet. It sounds like their flight has been rescheduled to tomorrow. So... We'll see. They're flying out of Bloomington. Um, so uh, how far is Bloomington from Indianapolis? Uh, just 45 minutes south. Yeah, so we'll see. I mean, they're supposed to fly out tomorrow um, and kind of a, a short turnaround from the, from travel. Um, Fisherman says that you see BTN, BTN, excuse me, BTN Plus is free all weekend. I did not. Um, I canceled my BTN Plus once the men were done there. The women do have one more game on BTN Plus, I think. Maybe not. I might not be sure. I'd look back at the schedule. They may have moved that to national TV. Let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We have got Ryan, who's been waiting on hold patiently. Ryan, welcome. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you tonight? Doing good. Doing good, Ryan. How you doing? I'm good, man. Good, man. Good. Real, real quick, before you, before you get into this, I want to give answer John's question. John didn't catch this. Uh, Frank is Tony Perkins' uncle, so um, we weren't trying to hide that. So go ahead, uh, Ryan. <laughs> Hey, uh, great win tonight. Um, I can't remember the last time we had three players get a double-double in the same game. Uh, you had 22 and 10 from Owen Freeman, uh, 19 and 10 from Peyton, and, of course, Tony with 11 and 15. And um, what I really thought was great with Tony is he really does just find ways to win. Um, his shot wasn't tremendous tonight but he found other ways to kill you. And it's so good to see that senior leadership really take center stage. He really, really does such a nice job of uh, setting the table for Owen Freeman, I thought, because I think it's pretty obvious Owen's the future uh, for you know years to come. And he's not afraid to trust that freshman for good reason, obviously, but, um, we, we, we really do have the makings of a real good team this year, I really think. Uh, regarding attendance, um, now truth be told, uh, my parents have been season ticket holders for men's basketball since 1983, and I actually am guilty for calling them off and telling them not to go because, you know, they're, you know, late 70s, early 80s, I didn't want them driving through this stuff. And um, from a safety standpoint, it was the second game, I think, in 42 years that they did not attend due to weather. I will be with my father at Purdue. If we can get Zach Eady in some foul trouble, and we can, uh, I, as Frank said, as Corey has said, it's all about hitting the three. If we're fairly hot, I think we have a shot. If Nebraska can beat these guys, I certainly think we can. What are your thoughts? Frank? 
I think, uh, you know, I think Corey and I talked about this last year. Big Ten to me is like a Royal Rumble. I think anybody can be anybody any given night, depending on who's hot. You know, we talked about this last year. We talked about this the year prior. And to your point, Ryan, like you said, if we get going early offensively, getting key stops, getting, um, you know, the, the big guy from Purdue into some foul trouble, I think we can we can match up with the best of them, you know. Um, and just and just in the Big Ten alone, I think we can be the best of them. Now, my only issue is, is like, and this is probably just a little bit off topic, but my issue with, with Big Ten basketball is that we get caught up in Big Ten basketball and then when we hit NCAA tournament time, we play these ACC schools, SEC schools. We don't adapt to the versatility of uh, other programs in the conferences play basketball. You know, we kind of play at a slower mm-hmm. half-court pace. We play an ACC team or SEC team. They play more of a faster pace. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, we still need to play our game on how we defend, which I think Fran and, and Sherman does a great job doing. But again, finding key ways to win this game, like you said, if we get hot early, we can win those big games. Absolutely. And Purdue, I mean, those, remember that game in West Lafayette was not close. That was a route. So we didn't shoot well either or play no. defense. No. And if they shoot well in Iowa City, you, you know, you're going to give yourself a chance, right? Um, I, I would like to see Fran, uh, you know, obviously. We do go through like we were up what uh seventeen to two early on, and it looked like you know we had the makings for a blowout, and then with seventeen minutes to go in the second half, they briefly actually took the lead, and so you know that lead was dissipated. Now to our credit, we took control and beat them by eighteen. So credit to us for that. It, I, I would like to see Fran maybe call a timeout a lot sooner because you could almost see these runs coming where you're up eight and before you know it, you're only up two and uh, you know, maybe just call a timeout. Let's regroup before the other team, which is obviously, you know, got all the momentum, try to break that momentum a little bit better uh, that's one observation that I do have that I would like to see. And I think we saw that again tonight where he kind of tends to just let you play through it and wait for the official timeout. I can see that. Um, I think they should have switched to the zone sooner. Agree. You know, that's what I think. That, that Frank, I don't put you on the spot, but I'm telling you, you know this, you're a coach. The last 15 minutes, that first half defensively were horrendous. Yeah, they gave up 14 layups and dunks on 16 field goals in the first half as a whole. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just like, and then one of the other two was a three, um, threes, layups, and dunks. And so many of those dunks and layups were well, they're dunks and layups, right? <laughs> they're right at the rim. Some of them were uncontested dunks, you yeah. know, a couple of those that Owen Freeman sold out for steals on. Um, what were your thoughts when watching that first half defensively? Iowa was up at halftime because they were really efficient on the offensive end, but. Like Ryan said, opportunity lost when they were up 17-2 to two early to kind of, what do they say, insert the knife and twist? Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just like you said, you know, I've, I've coached young men before, and it's kind of one of those, you know, you know, you think you knocked them out in the first round, but you didn't. They're still fighting. The brass are still fighting. They're in this game. It's, I mean, even down by 15, they're still going to fight and pull back away. I think it's just a, a young man's mentality. They're just thinking, saying, hey, okay, this team beat Purdue – we have them on their backs. Hello, the game's not over. You know, we're, we still have 15 minutes left on the clock. We still have a whole second half to play. And, you know, guys start being complacent. I wouldn't necessarily call that a coaching issue. It would just be players losing focus, thinking that Nebraska's going to just give up. No, Nebraska's a proven team. They beat the number one team in the country just last week. They're going to fight and rally back. So we kind of let our foot off the gas a little bit and realize, okay, we can't do that. We have to finish the game and go ahead and compete and win the game. So, and the this, main, this, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Frank. Uh, my last question, I'm curious what you have to say. Um, when you look at the box score, the minute distribution, uh, you know, one of my concerns of, of, of this particular team, while depth is wonderful, and I think we're, you know, as good as we've been in a long time from – the first player on the team to the 12th player on the team, the, you know, a 10, 11 
team a player rotation typically doesn't bode all that well. And at some point you got to shorten the lineup a little bit. And when you look at teams who do real well, teams who typically go far, they go seven deep, maybe eight. And I noticed today when you look at the minutes distribution, obviously your starters, Cricky was the least played at 22 minutes out of the starters. Tony the most at 37 minutes. Uh, Josh Dix got 27 minutes for good reason, and Brock Harding 11. From there, you had Dembele with five, Bronze and Bowen with three. So essentially, today was a seven-man rotation, essentially. And I'm wondering if maybe Fran is kind of at that point where he's ready to shorten the lineup. You know, for the first time, Bright Price Sanford did not even play. No. Um uh, maybe we are starting to see the seven to, you know, depending on if Bowen plays a little bit more, we might just be down to our eight man rotation and roll with it the rest of the way. Cause I or think it, that is kind of important. What do you guys think? Ryan, first of all, I'll say this about price Sanford. I, I think he's got potential to be an all time great from three. I mean, he's, you look at oh, his yeah. high school, the dude can rain it, but He's not right now. He doesn't look confident. He made, I think if you go back to the exhibition game, he made like four or five threes in that game and he was stroking it. And ever since then, you can just tell something's not working upstairs. I think right now there's a disconnect. Remember his brother had a stretch last year where he couldn't hit anything. Oh, I remember. I remember. So I I just think, you know, with Josh Dix, if you're going to get this level of production at him, which they have not to this point, Run with it. Roll with it. If Josh starts struggling, you're still going to give the kid minutes. But I think then if you're Fran, you maybe turn to Price and say, okay, let's see if we can get get you some threes. Because both those guys, that's, I mean, I know Josh gives you a lot of other stuff. Price's big thing right now, I think as a freshman, is going to be his ability to knock down open shots. But he just, he hasn't been getting open shots and he hasn't been making the ones he's had. So I think you could be right. Rotation-wise, Frank, do you think we're maybe starting to see here mid uh, January kind of a shortened rotation from Fran? Uh, no, I think he's going to expand it and fluctuate throughout the rest of the Big Ten season because, honestly, I think this game was a statement game. You guys can look at it from this standpoint. Okay, we lost Purdue. Nebraska just beat Purdue. Let's make a statement and beat Nebraska. You know what I mean? So I think that's why he's like, let me go to my key go-to guys and really give these guys the full capability of saying, hey, I'm going to give, you know, Kirky 22 minutes. I'm going to give Tony 35 minutes. I'm going to give – Peyton, 28 minutes, and just really just make a statement and say, hey, we might be one in three in the Big Ten, but that one in three does, does not describe who we are as an Iowa program, you know. So I think this was a statement game just to win. Uh, who, do we, who do we play next, Corey? Minnesota, Monday at 5 o'clock Central. Okay. At, Minnesota, at Minnesota. Minnesota. At Minnesota. Okay, so Minnesota just lost to IU. Yes, by right. 12. So come Minnesota, he <laughs> might go back to that 8-9 – 10 man rotation because again, not seeing, not taking credit away from Minnesota who they are, but again, looking at from statistically and just what we just seen last week, Nebraska just beat the number one team. So now everybody's saying to Nebraska, okay, who's this team? Who's this team that's highlighted to beat number one Purdue? Let's go ahead and make a statement and beat Nebraska. That's a big game Monday. I mean, tonight was a big game, and I said that the other night. That's a. Now, looking forward, like, that's a big game. Yeah. Because I don't know how good Minnesota is because Minnesota's played teams close. They played a weak mm-hmm. non-conference schedule. They've been terrible over the last couple of years. They've been bottom feeders in the league. The barn is always a hard place to play. Jake mentioned that earlier. He lives up in Minneapolis. I've been up there for, for games. I'm sure you have, too. Have you been in the barn, Frank? No, never been. I mean, Minnesota, fly. for me, is like an eight-hour drive. I know. Fly over to – listen, you got Indy to Minneapolis. Big airports fly. Make the flight over there Monday through through bad weather. And uh, hey, hopefully it. hopefully <laughs> it's not snowing in nine degrees. It's supposed to be nine degrees here on Tuesday. With, oh, I think it's, it's the high. I think the low is like negative two. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. No. I think our high on Monday, I think, is like negative two. Yeah. But the barn is a hard place to play. You got the raised floor. It just gets loud in there. It's an old arena. So, but I mean, to to go in there and get a win and make it three straight, huge. I mean, a big difference, I think, right now with this squad. You're going to play Purdue again if you're two and four versus three and three. 
Oh Ladies man, and- Carver will be rocking, I promise you. Yeah. Saturday if we well, and they won't be – Ryan, you and I both know they will not be favored. Nobody's going to expect oh, them to Of course win. not. Of course Purdue, not. But. but you know what? I've been to many games at Carver over the years where we weren't favored and we pulled it off. Uh, we can do it. We can do it uh, at home in a raucous environment, you know, B500 going in. That will go a long way erasing that ugly Michigan loss, which never should have happened. Yep. And um, – and then, of course, I'll be back in Iowa, and my father picked up a couple boxes of the Caitlin Clark cereal, so uh, I will have the breakfast of champions for the next couple weeks. Ryan, appreciate the phone call. We'll probably talk to you tomorrow. Thank you, guys, for your time. Have a good night and stay safe. You Thank too, you. Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, assuming we get this game tomorrow, um, tomorrow should be another fun one. We've got, uh, I think, two more callers left here. We've got uh, our Iowa Smokehouse line with the other Corey. Corey, welcome. How's it going, guys? <laughs> going good. How are you, sir? Uh, a little bummed. I had tickets for the game, but uh, I was not going to make the trek down there, unfortunately. I just was not worth it. Where, where are you at? Are you in Cedar Rapids? <laughs> uh, no, uh, I'm up by, uh, I'm in uh, Waverly up by Cedar Falls. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the, you made the right choice. Yeah, no, it was it was never gonna happen. And uh, Listen, if I was in Coralville, I don't know that I would have made it out there. And I'm just being frank. Well, I mean, yeah, no, me. it's it was it, it was definitely rough out there, and just uh, yeah, it was it was never gonna happen. But uh, you know, I still invited a buddy over. Lived you know lives just down the block, a couple blocks away, and I was like, come on over, we'll have some pizza, some drinks, and watch the game. And I. It was a good game. I mean, it was sloppy at times, but uh, you know, it's not everyone's going to be pretty. So, but they they did what they needed to do in that second half yeah. defensively. They did. I mean, this is not a great defensive team. We know that. No. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a great defensive team. Now we've said that no. before. Can this team yeah. win in March without great defense? Yeah, we saw the women do it, but the women don't. <clears throat> have, you know, again, the women have someone in, named Caitlin Clark who is just generational. I say, but I, I, one th- one thing at a time right now. Like yeah. Frank, you talked about the NCAA tournament, and I absolutely agree with you. But right now, this team—I know it's early—but this Iowa team is not projected in the field. Not that it matters at this point in the season, but they gotta like they gotta win Monday, and then you gotta figure out a way to to steal one. I mean, winning Monday is kind of a steal because you're on the road. They need to make up for that loss against Michigan. They didn't have a, a great non-conference resume. Their one good win was against Seton Hall. They got killed by Iowa State, got beat badly by Oklahoma. So they got to get some wins here to even be in the conversation right now. Um, but it was a good – this is where you start with two straight against two – I don't know how good Rutgers is. Nebraska appears to be a good team right now. Well, I guess I, I didn't even know. Frank, it's nice to meet you. I didn't even know you were going to be on. Nice to meet you. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I got a question for Frank, but uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I see a bunch of lunch pail guys on this team. And by lunch pail, I mean, you know, put in the work, get down to it, nitty gritty, like grind it out players. And I think these guys have a lot of pride and gusto in them to make this season what it can be. And uh, I, I just think they got a lot in them, and uh, I'm curious to see where they take it. Do you agree with that, Frank? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with Corey. You know, I mean, I think we're very nitty gritty, but again, I think our defense can improve. It, uh, it needs yeah. to improve. Um, mm-hmm. You know, years we've always been an offensive juggernaut. You know, but we need to also have key stops as well. You know. Um, and just having that key defensive guy, I think, you know, even though I'm Tony's uncle, you know, I'm not just, you know, <laughs> sure or anything, but I think he's probably our best on-ball defender by far. That's you know? that's what I was going to say, too. I say I think it starts with Tony. I, I do. I think the defensive, like, if this team wants to rally around someone, I think it's going to be Tony, to be yeah, quite honest. It's in a defensive philosophy, is really a buy-in. It's a, it's mm-hmm. a buy-in mentality. Like, we sit up here and say, hey, you, if I'm guarding you, Corey, and, I, and I'm to tell myself, Corey's not going to score tonight. If anything, Corey's going to get maybe two points on me, four points. It has to be a mentality. Yep. You know, I can't go into the game thinking, okay, I'm going to hit a three. He hits a three. I'm going to hit more threes than him. No, I have to stop my man from scoring. Mm-hmm. And I always tell my players, it's nice to coach him. Yo, if you can't score, make sure your man don't score. You know what I mean? That's just a mentality you have to have. Yeah. 
the basketball player, you know. So right. if we get that defensive mindset and just continue to make those, you know, marginal offensive stakes among the season, I think we'll be okay. Then you see, then you see where the season goes because right. you know it, it can be what you makes it. It can be what you make it after that, and I think that's that's what's important. Right. Um, also, just so everybody's aware, uh, Tony Perkins with his fifteen assists, he's the third Hawkeye in program history to have fifteen plus assists in a single game. That's per uh, Iowa Sports Information. So quite a, a feat for for that young man. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It's really good to hear. Um, no, I just, uh, I just really appreciate. I think what this team can be, and uh, honestly, it's just it's good to get the sweep on Nebraska football, basketball, wrestling. I got a bunch of buddies from Nebraska, and they're gonna hate hearing from me in the next couple of days. But <laughs> they, they let's see, they beat. Yeah, they already the women already played them in Carver, correct? I. I, th- no, I think they did. The, they play at. I know they play at Lincoln next month. So let's. Oh, wait. okay, okay, okay. They're, okay. they're at Lincoln. Yeah, next yeah. Month. No, but uh, yeah, no, you're right. It's good to yeah. good to see some dominance return because they got swept last. I mean, not Iowa lost mm-hmm. in football, lost twice in men's basketball. So, yep. Um, yeah. No. Absolutely. No, it's uh, it's good to get the sweep on them, and uh, I hope the ladies uh, wish the ladies luck uh, tomorrow. And uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to get to bed here. It's getting late for me. But you guys have a good one, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Corey. Take care. All right. uh, Tony wants to know about the TP merch. So you had mentioned this on a previous show about Tony Perkins' uh, shirts for his NIL. Did those Are those available? I know at one point you they were available, and then you took them offline. What's the status with the NIL stuff for Tony? Uh, So the custom TP shirts, we actually sold out. You know, uh, we actually sold out of them very quickly. Uh, we did not replenish that order. Um, I know they're selling TP shirts through the actual Iowa NIO store. So we kind of just let them at hand handle that. Um, you know, so I'm not really taking any orders right now. So I kind of let Iowa basketball kind of just, you know, uh, handle the rest. So, Tony, check out Iowa the Iowa NIL store. I think if you Google that. I'm guessing you can you'll find the website. I'm assuming is that right, Frank? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bob wants some. This is a football question. We'll, we'll cover it quickly. Did Kelton Copeland quit or get fired? Um, my understanding of the situation, Bob, is that Kelton was informed that he was not going to be brought back. So interpret that as you uh, as you will. I will be looking for a new wide receivers coach. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Before we do that, want to give uh, one final plug to. Iowa Smokehouse, uh, yes, they're awesome. Jerky, their uh, meat sticks, all of their products are great, and you can get it uh, and benefit this show, benefit this show and the coverage we're doing not only for men's basketball but also women's basketball, football, all of the above. Tasting is believing. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your order. This is a great company, family-owned company down in Albia, Iowa. Again, iowasmokehouse.com. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your order. You'll get free shipping with uh, $50 orders. Again, thank you to our our friends down at uh, Iowa Smokehouse. Also, I mentioned their barbecue sauce the other day. Mix that in with some barbecue pork. Beautiful. Beautiful on a uh, snowy, cold, wintry day. So uh, appreciate them sponsoring the show. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Who's on the line? Good evening, gentlemen. This is John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Uh, how are you? Doing good. How are you? Good. Uh, Corey, last uh, season you said Aaron Euless wouldn't surprise you if he transferred. Well, um, it, it surprised me when he did. Why did you think he would transfer? Um... <laughs> Uh, I said, you remember that? I did, I don't remember saying that. Did I say that during the season? I'm not surprised that I said that, but uh, I think, uh, honestly, his minutes were so up and down. I, I'd say that was my biggest thing. I felt like it was kind. Of, he was kind of on the same trajectory that Joe Toussaint was on. Like, he'd have performances defensively where he really show out, but he doesn't give you much offensively. You know, Fran's an offensive guy, as Frank said earlier. So, you know, you can see maybe the... I don't want to say a struggle in a relationship, but I think maybe just the up and down nature of of uh, how the coaching staff perceived he was playing. And I think in reality, how he was playing, he was up and down. 
He was not very good from three. Um, I, I didn't, you know, he wasn't real. The difference between him and DeSante Bowen is DeSante is offensive minded. Uh, I don't know that Aaron Euless was offensive minded, at least not at Iowa. It didn't appear to me that he was. DeSante's got to learn to hit shots, right, Frank? Like DeSante Bowen's got to make shots. Um, I He's a talented guy, but I would, I can, John, I don't know if you're trying to go that direction, but as it relates to DeSante Bowen, yeah, numbers are kind of in the same place. The difference is I think he's more of what Fran wants in a point guard, maybe naturally because of his score first mentality, but just your th- uh, thoughts on the situation with DeSante, Frank. Yeah, I think it's a system. Uh, every coach has a system and every player can't play in that system. Not to say that player is a bad player or, or he's not a good player at all, but every kid and everybody can play in a certain certain wheelhouse per se in which one to play, you know. And to 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 um your point earlier about Aaron Eulis, you know, I think he left because again, you know, finding a system that works for him and the way they play can make his game more flourish and more noticeable. I think you said the best Corey, he's looking for an offensive juggernaut. He might have been like a two side type of guy, but you know, maybe that did not fit what Aaron was thinking. And maybe there's miscommunication as far as what Fran went out of Aaron and what you know, Aaron wanted Fran to be as a coach, you know, and then even with, you know, DeSante, you know, is again, he needs to hit shots. He knows that. I think DeSante will be fine as years to come. I think this is that pivotal year in which he's figuring that out because in regards to, to Tony's sophomore year, Tony was the same wheelhouse. You know, he wasn't hitting shots. He was, he was passing up some open shots, but I think as time progresses, I think DeSante will build that confidence and, and find his rhythm. Well, four Nebraska games, and Aaron's not even seeing the floor as far as I've seen. Well, he's not. I don't think he's on the team right now, right? He had the gambling stuff happen, John. So he was he was involved with the, the betting scandal. Well, post game tonight said he was uh, talking to Aaron, who's on the bench. Okay. Well, maybe he's on, maybe he's on the bench, but he's uh, – yeah, you're right about him not playing. Do you know the status on him, Frank? Yeah, he was. I saw him to the, the TV. I saw Aaron in the huddle, but I think because of the the betting situation, I don't know too much as far as what the conclusion was. But I'm assuming just maybe he just has a year that he has to maybe sit. I, you know, I don't know the the actual end result, but I did know he was in the betting situation. Yeah, that's good. That's I'm good glad though. glad that he's not off the team. That's I'm happy to hear that. It's not doesn't sound like it's a situation quite like Arlen Bruce down at Oklahoma State that uh, you know he's. Sounds like he's done with college football. So, uh, yeah, it does sound like um, I'm just looking here. This was in November. Aaron Euless had pled guilty to uh, underage gambling and um, potentially facing – this was – again, this was in November. He was potentially facing a one-year suspension. So I don't know if that's come down yet, but uh, he's got two years of eligibility remaining, and it says – and this this is according to Hus- Husker Extra. He could remain as a practice squad member – for this year and then play his fifth and final year at, um, at, uh, in you, uh, this is interesting. It says, uh, while the Huskers signed Euless with the hopes he'd be an experienced big 10 point guard, Nebraska signed ball state transfer boogie Coleman. Once Euless was implicated, didn't you play a ball state, Frank? I, I, I sure did. I actually know boogie. <laughs> Do you know boogie? Okay. Um, don't know him personally like that. I, I've seen him in passing high and by. I, I, I believe I've seen his folks a few times. Just real brief high and by. But but no, Ball State does produce some good product, though. Why is Boogie not playing? He didn't play tonight. Um, good. I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, outside of AU being in Nebraska, I mean, I really don't follow NU basketball too, too much, you know. I was really close with uh, Aaron's dad and mom and his family, which are really good people. Um, outside of that, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> Just making sure that because his real, real first name is Juron. Yeah, I don't know what's uh, – I'm just seeing on his uh, his Twitter profile, it looks like early November he uh, hit a step-back shot against someone. might have been against Miami. So he has played this year, but I don't know if he's hurt or, or what's going on. But anyways – uh, sorry to sorry, go off on a rant there, John. No, you're fine. Um, if you look on the women's, go on the the schedule and click on tickets. Seat Geek is their 
the secondary market. Mm-hmm. And if you click on that, they're charging $167 to $297 a ticket for women's games. Uh, that, that bothers me thinking that some young lady might say, Dad, I'd like to go watch Caitlin and the Iowa women play in person. And he says, Honey, I can't afford the three to $600 it costs to get us into the game. Well, it's all about demand, right? Uh, Frank, you can't you can't add extra seats in there. I mean, they're a they're a hot ticket. I don't know. They've sold out every they've sold out every road game that they have scheduled the rest of the way now. Every single one. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, you got to think, man. When when uh, Kalen was uh, when when they played LSU. You know, they compared that to, like, how Kalen is with Angel Reese was kind of like the Larry Bird and Magic Johnson effect all over again, you know. So when you see that again, you know, in history, just but on the women's side, hey, man, it's, 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 a, it's a sight to see. All right. Well, gentlemen, you stay warm and stay safe. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. All right. All uh... right. This has been fun. Uh, final question from Scott. He says, with Copeland leaving, do you think Ferentz has an OC in place that hasn't been announced? Have you been following the hunt for Iowa's next offensive coordinator, Frank? Uh, when I look at your Twitter page, I have, Corey. <laughs> yeah. Are you, uh, do you get, have you gotten involved with Iowa football since Tony's been here? Uh, I, I hate to say this, man. I think we Don't tell me about- you're a Michigan guy. We, you've already <laughs> said this. I'm what a Michigan this? man. Yeah, I'm a go blue. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you're, I'll give you credit for this. You're not a bandwagon because you've told me this before. Yeah. That's so, so Tony has two. He has an older cousin, uh, Anthony Henderson, actually played uh, back between you know '94 to '97. So, it's a it's a it's a family thing. So we've been we've been Michigan people since you know the early '90s. So he was kind of. It was funny that when he decided to sign with Iowa, you know, we were like, okay, good. It's, it's, it's basketball. You know, football would have been a, you know, <laughs> I think it would have been a, a divided family at that point. But, no, I mean, we're, we're – we're, I mean, I support Iowa football. I don't have anything against Iowa football. I think uh, – I hate to get his name in Korea. I think it's Higgins. I think, he, yeah, Higgins. He's from the Indianapolis area. He actually played basketball um, – AAU basketball. He was very good. He was very, very, very talented. Okay. He actually played for a nearby AAU program, which we're good, we're good friends with. And he could have played either sport. Like he was a, a dominant basketball player and a dominant football player, but obviously football was his passion. But yeah, yeah. So um outside of that, we support him and his family. So of course, by default, you know, we're Iowa football fans, because I know his dad and family. So um yeah, so I'm a I'm an Iowa Michigan guy. I am. Small world. We got Roy coming on here, I think, later this month. So I'm looking forward to it. He, uh, the Higgins family is great. They got a lot of energy, and yeah, yeah. and um, you know, his son um, has been a great story at Iowa. Just his patience waiting behind a couple of really well, a great in Jack Campbell, who's now playing on Sundays for the Lions, and um, you know, Jay's going to have a chance to do the same thing. Come back for an extra year, so good stuff. And um, LFG. It's Frank from Indy. You're, yes. you're an indie guy, right? Naps out. You still coaching with um, Mr. Devin Archie? Uh, we'll see. I'm actually, which is funny, is uh, I might be coaching girls. I might have a, a girls AAU team. Yeah, my, my niece is really good. My my Tony's brother, younger brother, my nephew, Davion Hampton, um, he plays for George Hill's program. So I don't coach for George Hill, but my niece, who is – a fourth grader gonna be fifth grader. She actually just won today. Quite you ask. She won today her school's basketball knockout competition. So of all the kids, boys and girls that competed in, in knockout, which we know when you take the shot from the free throw line and you gotta make it first before the behind person behind you makes it, she actually won then over the entire school. Awesome. Well, mm-hmm. that you you've been inspired. To, have you been inspired at all by the? The Iowa, I mean, I'm sure you follow Iowa women's basketball, right? Oh, yeah, 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 I keep up, yeah. Uh, Ari Gold wants to know if you're rooting for the Colts this weekend. 
I don't know if that's a joke, but we we lost to <laughs> the Texans. Well, right. You know <laughs> so, that really. Our gold me off, mean. Man. I don't want to talk about the Colts. That really made me mad. But yeah. And it was an Iowa guy who dropped the. Pants. <laughs> it, was, it was an Iowa guy, bro. Do you hey, see why I say? Do you see why I say go blue? Like, <laughs> who is that on? Is that on Tyler Goodson or is that on Minshew? Goodson is a young player. I mean, I you know it's hurtful to have the city on somebody's back and be like, you know, the, the, the pro ba- pro basketball, pro football is very ruthless when it comes to fan bases. You know, college can be the same way, but that is actually on the coaching staff. You know, a you have one of your best players, Jonathan Taylor. You keep him on the field. I mean, we were fourth and one. Just give it to JT. But. You know, the Colts call what they want to call. And here, listen, they're at home watching the game just like I will next week. You know what I thought was weird about that call? And I wasn't watching it live. Uh, I'll be watching every playoff game I can, you know, here in the next couple of weekends. But I was not watching that game live. I hear that Tyler Goodson drops the pass. Like, that's the headline on ESPN. And I'm like, I didn't know Tyler Goodson was playing. Yeah. Like, I knew he was on the roster, but I didn't know he played. And then I look back, he, he doesn't play. He doesn't play. Why Why are you – like, no offense. With all due respect, Tyler Goodson, I get they've ran the play before in practice, and I would have loved for Tyler Goodson to have that moment, but it's almost unfair to Tyler Goodson to never play him and then put him in that position. When like, you have your – when you have any, – any, I don't care what sport you're playing. When it's the game on the line, you give it to your best player. I don't care if the defense knows. I don't care if the whole entire world knows. You give it to your best player and let them make a play. And it was a catchable. You pay the big money for. It was a catchable pass, but it was not a good throw. No. And I feel bad for Tyler Goodson. Good kid. You could tell after he's emotional about it and and understandably. So the sad part about that is, and I'll just say this. uh, Nobody cares what I say on Tyler Goodson. But the sad part about that whole story, Frank, I could see Tyler never really playing again in the league. And I hope that's not the case, but sometimes those are the things like he hasn't hardly played up until this point. Sometimes mm-hmm. these are the moments that define someone. And I hope that's not the case for him. Um, he'll get stronger as a person, but as a player in the league, I just hope that that doesn't define his career. I remember Marvin McNutt back in the day had a, a gaff on special teams for the Carolina Panthers. And that kind of derailed his NFL career. And I, I just hope that doesn't happen with Tyler. You know, I, I pray for that young man, you know, and he's going to say this for him. Hey, man, you know, you know, God got your back. He's going to take care of everything and can and continue to, you know, create a path on which you'll be successful in. So I think just keep your head up high, continue to play the football, which you got to play football, and he'll continue to guide your steps. So we've all been in that situation, Corey, where we've been in a big and spotlight situation. We feel like we dropped the ball, you know, but I think, you know, as long as he continues to get back up and try again, He'll make successful plays in the NFL and have a great career. The Iowa Hawkeyes defeating uh, Nebraska this evening, 94-76. A couple notes before we log off here. Appreciate uh, Tony Perkins' uncle here, Frank Henderson, good friend of ours and a uh, friend of the show's, joining us here for the second half of the show. And Iowa, uh, again, with a route tonight against a team coming off a, a win over the top-ranked uh, Purdue Boilermakers the other night. So really solid win for Iowa and this does put uh, Fran in elite territory as it relates to all-time victories. He ties Dr. Tom Davis for most wins in Iowa men's basketball history, 271. And yes, the Hawkeyes had three players with double-doubles. That's happened twice this year. Pretty impressive stuff. Peyton Sanford had the 16-10 and 10 with five assists, made five threes. And uh, obviously, Tony had uh, 11 points, 15 assists, just two turnovers. Those are numbers you'd love to see. And uh, again, I think there's part of the reason why you saw less minutes for DeSante Bowen because Tony's seeing the floor like that. Hey, uh, let him run the show. Uh, Owen Freeman finished with 22 and 10. He continues a phenomenal freshman year. And then Josh Dix had 16 big points. Ben Cricky filled a void there in the second half with 12 points on five of seven shooting. Patrick McCaffrey comes off an illness with 12 points, five rebounds. Need to be getting at least five boards a game from Patrick. That's good to see. He needs to at least be giving you five, in my opinion. Uh, Iowa had six players finish in double figures. That's the third time it's happened this year. Iowa made a season-high 15 three-point field goal attempts, shot 52% from the field, 
and 30 assists on 35 field goals. Those are numbers you'll take. Uh, just six turnovers, and several of those turnovers came early in that first half uh, as Nebraska was kind of climbing back in it when they dug themselves the early lead. Nebraska got back in the game, a couple sloppy plays, but Iowa corrected it. Iowa limited Nebraska to four of 26 from three-point range, and you know they, they figured out a way to attack the Iowa zone, but it was a little too little too late and missed some threes out of that zone. That certainly helped the cause, and I thought Owen Freeman helped the cause rebounding out of that zone. As you know, Frank, not always easy to find a man and body up, but uh, thought Iowa held their own on the glass. For the night on the glass, uh, Iowa was uh, actually won won the rebounding battle, thirty six to thirty four. Part of that is, uh, well, actually, Iowa shot a uh, let's see total for the game. Uh, yeah, Nebraska shot a lesser percentage, forty forty eight percent, but still a decent percentage from the field. Not good from three four or twenty six overall, um, and Iowa, of course. Wins it easily by this it looks to the score seventy six to ninety four, and a very efficient night from uh, from the floor for the Hawkeyes. They'll bounce back uh, with hopefully a third third straight win on Monday against Minnesota, uh, five p.m. Central Time tip from the barn up in Minneapolis. So uh, be with us here for post game coverage, and remember, folks, that tomorrow night, pending the weather. We've got Iowa, Indiana women, 7 p.m. Central time with Gus Johnson and the crew on Fox. That'll be fun. And then uh, get it locked right here. Iowa post game with special guest Kashin Alexander. Kashin Alexander, an all-time great Hawkeye. So uh, we're looking forward to Kashin joining us tomorrow night. And uh, Frank, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to have you on here. Thank you. I know it's later out there in the, the uh, uh-huh. Eastern time zone, so get some sleep. Uh, yeah. Brave the winter weather as we have here. and. Um, We'll hope for a third straight victory Monday. Go Hawks. All right, folks, for Frank Henderson, I'm Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Have a great night. We'll talk to you soon.